Uh, right now, the newest uh, the project I'm currently working on, which is here in uh, Nepal and in Tanzania, is to look at a new way to intervene and, in fact, to look at a way to potentially scale up knowledge uh, exchange about poultry. Uh, a partner here in Nepal is Heifer Nepal, which is doing an incredible job. I, I just love working with Heifer, and, and they've been implementing the program quite well. And then Tanzania is Sokoena University of Agriculture in Tanzania. Um, I'm going to skip a few slides, but I'm going to keep this short. I think I have a few too many slides in here. So really what I want to cover, though, is the value of the chicken, the challenges of the village. I call it village chicken, local chicken, whatever you uh, There's a reason I call it, but I won't get into it now. But uh, improving village chicken and then strategies for intervention with regard to chicken. I think this is probably one of the, the least um, uh, uh, respected animals in the last 60 years of development, and unfortunately hasn't given the attention it needs because it plays a very critical role. And I think now in the last five, 10 years, a lot more people have been looking at chicken. Uh, for example, uh, feed conversion-wise, it has the highest feed conversion of any of the livestock animals we're talking about except for fish. Uh, fish would be the only high, uh, one that has a higher feed conversion ratio. So when I look at a village, and, and a lot of these are from Africa, I have some of the Paul slides, but uh, I see dollar signs and, and micronutrients running around the ground. Uh, if you, um, the value of nutrition, if you talk most of the nutrition experts in this room, they'll tell you about we're particularly interested in micronutrient malnutrition, and if the best sources of that are frankly an animal-based source. And then if you ask who what animal-based sources the poorest of the poor have access to in rural areas? Well, if they don't, they don't live next to the ocean or a lake, it's most likely poultry and chicken and eggs. Um, and uh, you know, the key micronutrients uh, for women and young children, uh, and it's a superb support, uh, uh, source of protein. It's also extremely accessible. I could put a hard-boiled egg in my pocket today, walk around for a week and eat it, and I wouldn't get sick. Or any other, I can't think of too many other animal source foods I could put in my pocket and carry it till next week and then eat it without getting sick. Um, also, uh, it's small size. It encourages consumption by people who can't afford. They're not going to slaughter an entire goat very often. Um, it's also, um, you know, again, can be eaten in one setting. Uh, and it's very important during the dry season when much of the forage is gone for, for example, uh, uh, garden vegetables and things. Poultry is still running around providing eggs, high nutrients. Um, so income is also a very critical thing. In a lot of the areas that we work, people are so poor, the egg even is too high a value, they will sell it and buy maize meal and other things, but it is, again, a source of income. Uh, and it's particularly important for women as a source of income. Uh, I know more about, I'm slowly learning Nepal, I've only been working in Nepal for about a year. But uh, in Africa, uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa, about 10 to 35% of the woman's income is from poultry, and that's before any intervention. That's just with the scrawny little birds running around the ground. Um, and they tend to spend money on things that are very important for the household health. I like to show this chart because one of the things that is neglected is actually the local chicken. I would say one of the biggest mistakes typically in, in many failed poultry projects over the last 50, 60 years is the first reaction is people want to give an improved breed. That's been bred for ideal production system conditions. But if you look in a village where maybe they're getting 40 to 60 eggs a year out of five hens with a little bit of intervention, primarily which is vaccinating for Newcastle, uh, you can go up where they quickly have 50, 60 birds and they're getting, I mean, pardon me, they're getting 50, 60 eggs a year, 70, 80 or more, and they can get up to 10, 15 to 20 hens. And you're talking about a four and a half, five fold increase in production. Now, if you mentioned that person, woman's income was 10 or 30% and you increased it five fold, you're having a life changing impact on that household. And that's what women will tell you. When, you, when one of these projects has been in, implemented and you go back into the village and talk to the women, they'll go, I bought a tin roof for my house. I could send my kid to a, a, a rural clinic when he was sick, and I paid school fees for the first time. I also, again, this is just to show that actually uh, people also need knowledge about how to sell their, their eggs. I always said if you can get twice the price for an egg because you're a savvy sa seller, that's a lot easier than trying to raise twice as many uh, eggs. And so... But again, if you can double that with a little bit of training about how to sell your eggs. Um, so it's practical. I'll skip this. But there's a lot of reasons they're very practical uh, to engage in. It's also, there's evidence, a number of studies, that the chicken is one of the very, very first businesses poor people can do. You don't even have to have a chicken. You don't have to have land. You can have, borrow a hen next door. And in 18 months, you can have 20 hens. Uh, and you can return a hen. 
So it actually requires real. This gentleman, I'm going to talk about a minute how we're training sixth grade children. And this gentleman was one of the sixth grade kids' dads. He came in, he never raised chicken. He sat in on the class. He went home, invested $1,300, and now he has, at any one time, 130, 190 birds, and he, he sells about 50, 60 eggs per week, and it subsidized him to create a SIM card business. This is a kind of, again, it's usually a first business often. Either the business might be to step up and go into goat production, but the chicken they can start with. These are the challenges of chicken production throughout the developing world, whether you're talking about Nepal, Nicaragua, or Tanzania. Uh, I always say attitude because most people, if you ask people to raise a few chickens, they actually give it very low priority. And the reason why is they die. Twice a year, Newcastle disease comes through these communities in Nicaragua, in Nepal, in West and East Africa, and most of the chickens die. You're not likely to invest in a coop. You're not likely to invest in any specialized feed if you know your chickens are going to die. But as soon as you actually do the, really the big priority is vaccinate for Newcastle and some other measures, the birds start living in a very short period of time, three months. They have a lot of birds and they go, oh, yeah, I, I, maybe I should be raising chickens. I didn't know we could prevent the birds from dying. And, and the attitude changes very quickly. The other, uh, five, so the highest, biggest problem far and away is preventing disease. And even more narrower than that, if you don't vaccinate for chicken, uh, for Newcastle disease, the rest of this is almost a waste of time. Uh, but uh, there's other little challenges, you know, improving housing, finding cheap feed for supplemental feeding, uh, focusing on chick survival and, and market skills. Uh, the interventions match those. You can't, you're not going to really have success if you go in and do one thing, which I'm sure all of you know. It's usually a package of things. This has to be fairly holistic. I won't go into it. I don't really think I have the time. Um, and what I want to point out is, it, it, is uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, is that we've looked at multiple mechanisms of intervention. So we've trained extension advisors. We've trained uh, district veterinary officers, we train women farmers groups, we train village leadership, and all of that works. It particularly works if you do all of the above. But when you step back and you've done that and it works, it was expensive. And there's never going to be enough extension agents. And you say, well, how are you going to reach the rural masses? And in our thinking, we could only think of two institutions, either religious institutions or primary schools. Primary kids and women raise, are mostly the ones who raise chickens. So we decided, well, what if we train sixth grade children? And that is what our current uh, livestock uh, innovation lab is funding us to do in 10 schools in central Tanzania and, and six primary schools here in, in uh, Dong district in Nepal. We are training the sixth grade kids how to vaccinate for Newcastle disease and other poultry husbandry practices. And then we're measuring, does that translate into improved production at home? Uh, and we're about right in the middle of that project at the moment. We had a pilot project prior to this in four schools in, in Tanzania, a very, very poor community. Uh, we only assisted those schools in the first year. And we're now, it's now five years later, and all five schools are still functioning with no further input. And in fact, egg sales are subsidizing things like paying for the security guard on campus, uh, paying for uh, writing materials, et cetera. So that's where we are now, and the reason we're at the school part, and I don't think that is going to be, you know, is a, is a mechanism on its own. But I do think it is a, something to think up about scaling up. So for example, we called this project Poultry Skills for uh, Rural Livelihoods. It could be life skills for rural livelihoods. I mean, you could be teaching about, obviously, nutrition. You could be teaching about clean water in the same mechanism as part of the normal curriculum of, of young children when they go home. So uh, that's a classroom in Tanzania. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what this includes, we train the teachers. The teachers train the kids. Uh, it's hands-on. We built, like the fish project, ponds on the school ground. We put a chicken coop on the school ground, and they actually raise the chickens on campus. Uh, we offer trainings for the parents through the teachers. We, what's a very key thing is to connect the school with a veterinary officer or the source of vaccine and make that connection so they can always uh, get access. And the last thing we're experimenting with is the kids <laughs> collecting the data. You know how expensive it is to collect data. Uh, here in Nepal, we ask the kids uh, in the six schools to go home and collect the data on baseline data. And in one night, they came back with 473 data sets. Now, to, for my professional household interviewer, that's about $10,000 in two months of work. 
And, uh, and so we're going to compare the two data sets, my professional household interviewer and the kid's data set. I have a feeling the kid's data set's going to be better. But, uh, uh, but we're doing the same thing uh, here in Nepal and Tanzania where we do the data. I mean, that is overnight. You have 500 households of data. That's just astonishing. Uh, and that's basic things like how many eggs a week do you eat? You know, how many chickens do you have? When was the last time one died? The basic information we need to assess production. Thank you. To learn more, please visit agrilinks.org and feedthefuture.gov.